Hello, and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. Now, on this episode, I'm going to do my final video concerning Fire in the Sky, the Great Pacific War, 1941-45, to and this one is going to cover the combat phase uh, of the game. So, I have in previous videos done deployment, done my operations, Again, deployment, kind of maneuvering your pieces into position. Operations, we're coming to grips with the enemy. And now it's time to smack them. Time to get at it and see who can pull off, shall we say, the victory for the particular battles. And um, what sometimes could be extremely unpredictable fights in the Pacific theater. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is basically talk about and cover several battles... Uh, that I want to use to illustrate some things. And again, these may not be the best moves in the game. Um, these may not be the best strategies. But again, it's just illustrating different things about the game that I think it's important to be aware of to help you wrap your head around uh, everything that's happening. So, first of all, before we get into the battles here, uh, I just want to give another shout-out to um, Whiff Wendell on Board Game Geek. Uh, Wendell's been a big help to me sorting things out, making sure I've got ideas correct, because again, he is a man who, quote, loves this game, and he understands it very well. So in order for me to bring you the videos to kind of share with everybody and to help um, and to teach, because that's what I have always been by trade um, and calling, really, too, his help has been really instrumental in helping me clear things up and sort things out. So again, I just want to give him another shout out and give him credit uh, for his assistance. Now, prior to the combat phase here, the phasing player, in this case the Japanese, the player whose turn it is, can commit air units. Now, committing air units basically means that you can take an air unit from a base hex that is one hex away from a combat situation and commit those air units to it. The battle basically will turn them into long range units. Now, what exactly am I talking about here? Well, let me show you. Let me shift over here. And I'm going to zoom in on a couple of places here, and I'll move you along with me as we go. So first of all, let's zoom in up here on Singapore. Okay. Now you can see there, come back just a tiny bit, see there at Saigon, I have a stack of four units there, eight steps all together, that are pointed at Singapore, because I want to get this thing over with. I want to support the Japanese army that's there and win this thing and capture those victory points, among other things. And the oil, of course, naturally is there too. So again, notice that the air units are just pointed that direction. They don't actually leave the hex in question. Defending air units can only participate in combat in the hex they actually physically occupy at that moment. So if you don't have any air steps in that space as the defender, you're not getting any air power for ground support or air-to-air -air combat. Forget about it. Okay. Now, if we go up here, here's another situation to show you. I flew down planes again from Formosa. And I'll be honest with you, um, in decision-making theory, what I'm doing we would call the recency effect. Because of my previous plays of this, I have had such a hard time capturing Manila. And I don't know why. So this might be a little overkill. These airplanes might actually be better suited elsewhere. And again... Uh, eventually, after you rampage the Japanese, you're going to want to spread these out. Because remember, the six hexes around where air units are are zones of control, and they can stop enemy naval movements. Uh, they can hinder things. So you do want to deploy them strategically during the deployment phase uh, to maximize their benefit. But right now, I'm trying to just crush the enemy where they're at. And then, of course, the last one I have an air unit committed at is right over here. Let's see if I can find them here. There they are. Where we're going to start our battles here down at the Gilbert Islands. Notice that air unit from the Marshalls is going to be flying in to give support. So that again is an option only for the phasing player, aka the attacking player. All right, so we're going to start with this battle over here in the Gilberts. Notice I have the battle marker there. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to zoom back out first. And then I'm going to go ahead and move all these units to the battle board. And we'll talk about how combat works when we get over to the battle board here in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and move everybody and everything here to this spot. Now, 
the battle board is right here. And let me zoom in on it a little bit more. Get a little tighter. There we go. All right. Well, almost got tight. Hold on a second. Got to move something here. There. There, I think that's a good shot. Okay. Now, you can see there's two different sides to the battle board here and some different spots to it. Up top side here, we have air points. Okay, this is where the air units are going to battle for air supremacy over the combat hex, wherever that happens to be. You also have a box for carrier task force, where you can put any task force that has a carrier involved in it has to go into um, these boxes. Okay. You also have Bombardment Task Force. Now, the Bombardment Task Force can do a couple of things. Task Force that go into here can either give ground support to your invading amphibious assault or, more importantly, grab control of the sea. Because if you don't get control of the sea, you're not going to be able to land your amphibious assault anyway. So you want to kind of balance that as the attacker uh, when you're doing that. And also you have boxes for land and air units that are at bases. And if there's any ships caught in anchor, kind of like the first turn whenever Pearl Harbor is attacked, they would go there. And of course the Japanese have their own equivalent side. Now one thing I want to say uh, and point out here early on I made a big mistake on was when I saw the task force, and again a task force is one to four ships in this game, I saw these spaces, I thought these were for the individual ships rather than you can put a task force here, a task force here, a task force here, etc. So I was having some pretty small naval battles when really you can have some epic naval clashes if you really want to. Um, you know, you can kind of recreate Midway and have all those carriers up there fighting. So um, just kind of be advised of that. One other big thing, too, is that when you're placing air and land units that are being transported by sea, you don't want to put them in the carrier box because they will not be able to launch their amphibious assault. So just keep that in mind uh, when you're doing that. In other words, don't put them in the wrong spot. Okay? All right, now the first thing that happens in every single battle phase is we have the submarine fight okay each player can commit submarine points before we even get anybody on the battle board you can target things here okay now typically the allies end up using their submarine points for strategic warfare because as you knock down that merchant pool which starts at 30 the Japanese get to reset their transport points only to the height of the merchant pool so as that merchant pool shrinks so does the Japanese ability to transport things and again you must have transport points to move around uh, air and land units. If those start to disappear, you're going to be in big trouble. Okay, So, Japan has two sub points to get every single turn. The Allies get a, a, a flexible amount uh, as the game goes on. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and use one of my sub points and I'm going to target one of the big US cruisers that got in here. Now the US strategy trying to sneak into here is this. Survive the air attack and be able to attack that one Japanese destroyer unit that is kind of foolishly there all by itself trying to get the amphibious assault pulled off. That's their game plan here. So we'll see if they can pull that off or not. So first we'll have to see whether the subs can give me an advantage here. So ASW Warfare or ASW Step is the first thing we're going to do here. Okay? And for combat you have Let's see how well I can get this together. Here we go. You have this combat table. Notice you have combat types and all the modifiers that go with it. Use this religiously when you first start playing this game. Make sure you go through each one of these. Okay, like submarine attack on a task force. You want to go through all these and make sure you're getting the modifiers, positive or negative. Same thing here um, with the ASW uh, that's going on. And notice here at the top, this is a to-hit type of game. So you hit on a 5 or a six. So we'll go ahead first here and see. The only way you get to do ASW is if the defending force has a destroyer. They don't. The US has two heavy cruisers and one light cruiser. So the Japanese will get the chance to use their point and we need a five or a six and bam we did manage to land a six. So it got hit. Now when it comes to damage, damage works like this. After a round of combat, you go ahead and roll. For every hit that's on a ship, you look to see what kind of damage it takes. So let's take a look at the naval damage table right here. Okay. Now notice with it, basically two things will happen. You roll two dice. And if that total is equal to or greater than the defensive rating on a ship, 
the unit is sunk. If it is less than it, it is unit is damaged and you have some modifiers there. Notice we have a submarine attack hit here, which gives us a plus two modifier. Now, on the ships, you have, and I'll tell you what, let me just zoom in because it's, I think it's easier sometimes to zoom in rather than try to pick the counter up and bring it. So let's zoom in here on one of these heavy cruisers. We'll go with this one on the end. It really doesn't matter. All right. Now, if you notice here, you got all these points here on this, all these values. Now, remember last time I said this is the transportation point. Over here, we have the firepower, the anti-aircraft, we have defense, and we have speed. So this is a nine. So basically, with this dice roll, I'm going to do, when I roll it, if I manage to get a seven or more, because it's plus two to the dice roll, that ship will be sunk. No, oh, but it is a four. So the cruiser will survive. Now, when a cruiser or any other ship is damaged, the damage really matters on the number of hits. So here we had one hit from the sub. What you do then with the hits is you double them. So we're going to double that to two. And that's how many friendly reinforcement phases later they come into the game. Now, I do stress friendly reinforcement phases because right now the Japanese turn is on. The Allies have not had their friendly reinforcement phase yet. So strictly speaking, what's going to happen here in a moment, and let me zoom out just a little bit, is we're going to count two friendly reinforcement phases. Well, there's one coming later this turn, and here's the second one. So back, they'll be back in April and June of 1942. But right now, all I wanted to do was get those subpoints you or get that subpoint used to try and get rid of that enemy unit. That was my big thing here because now that I kind of blundered and only sent a destroyer to escort that infantry unit, I really, really, really have got to destroy these two surface ships or at least damage them and send them home so that I can get through and get into the area. Okay? Alright, so that's the sub step. Uh, and sub points for the Japanese are use them or lose them kind of thing. So you get two a turn. So I'll be using another one here a little bit later with another. Um, combat example that we'll be doing. Okay, So now the next thing we do is the battle board preparation step. Now basically what that is, what we do here is this. We put any long-range aircraft like the ones I had at the Marshall Islands there. Any carrier task force will go into a carrier task force box and then any surface one, any bombardment one, will go into a box as well and of course the US has their two units there. Okay, so we've placed everybody on the battle board. Now we're ready to roll. Now the next thing would be air-to-air -air combat round. Okay, however, we don't have enemy air points, but we're still going to count up the Japanese air points that we have. So let's zoom in here and see what Japan has. Now the Japanese, there we go, there we are. The Japanese will get a total of five air points here. Now, long range air means you only get half the value here, which is two. So we'll get one point for that. And then the aircraft carrier, that's the middle number here. Carriers have this extra number. There's another four points. So that gives a total of five. So if there was air to air combat, and don't worry, there will be in the next example because we've got a couple of carrier forces that are going to be fighting near a bull. Um, We'll get to that here, and you'll see how air-to-air -air combat works with that. But right now, there is none, because the Japanese basically have total control here. Okay? Now, next thing we would do after that is target determination. So basically, air units can target a couple of things. You can target with an airstrike opposing naval units, and also you can target air units on the ground. Okay, and try to destroy them. Notice, I said air and not land, because you cannot attack a land unit with an airstrike in this game. It is not possible. The only thing an air unit can do for a, a ground battle is do ground support. Okay. But I don't think I'm going to need that because, well, there are no enemy troops on the Gilberts other than maybe some small garrison that's not represented at this scale in the game. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all five air points and put them on this task force here. Okay. So now we've determined our target. And now we will go ahead and total up the anti-aircraft points of the entire force there. So if there was four ships here instead of two, we would total all their anti-aircraft fire up and fire at the attacking air points, whatever ones are committed, because I could have split them up. Uh, you know, if there had been an enemy uh, air unit there at the base, I could have put two units, two air points there and three air points on the task force. But I'm putting all five because there ain't nobody else, ain't nobody else here, so to speak. So we'll total up the two anti-aircraft points. So there's two on the light cruiser 
and two on the heavy cruiser. That gives a total of four. And we'll roll four dice. And again, we're looking for fives and sixes. We got one five, so we got one hit on that. So now we'll adjust the air points down. Now notice, I didn't do anything with the air unit in the long range air box or the aircraft carrier. Because basically when your air units are hit at this stage of the game, it's basically saying they're defeated. Um, they're not really destroyed. You know, it's kind of like other games when you, you eliminate a unit in combat. You know, it's not like you kill every single last person in the formation. It's basically you're rendering them combat ineffective. Well, in this particular case, you know, some of the planes didn't get through for whatever reason. Uh, maybe they had to, you know, peel off or they had mechanical problems or maybe they did take some shots and were like, shoot, man, I got to get home. Um, either way. That's what we're talking about here, okay? The only way to destroy land-based air units is to hit them with an airstrike itself or take over their base, okay? So I have four units here, and now that I have these four air points left, I can decide where to put them on these ships. So what I'm going to do is, because I want to get rid of both of these, because the destroyer is not very strong in combat, and I just use these white dice. This is just my thing here. I'm going to put two air points each on those. And again, I'm looking for fives and sixes. And let's take a look at the combat table. And we'll go ahead and see what kind of modifiers we have here for an airstrike phase. Okay? And I guess we can all look along together here. So let me find the airstrike. There's the airstrike phase. So if a player has air superiority, Japan does, we get plus one. Notice there's also a bonus for um, the opening turn, okay? Um, and there's also other things too, like if you're attacking an air land unit as part of a task force. Remember, they're being transported at sea, basically, is what's happening here. But all I'm getting here is a plus one modifier because I have air superiority, okay? So I'll roll my first two dice, my first two points. And I rolled a four and a three. Well, I will go up by one. So that will score me one hit of damage on the light cruiser. Okay, four plus one is five, and I need fives and sixes to do this here. Now the other strike, also two more air points. That one, I rolled a six and a five. So that's actually two hits on that big heavy cruiser. And as you use your air points up, you just slide the marker down here. So now I have no air points left at all for the rest of this turn. But that's okay because now I've achieved my goal. I'm either going to send those ships home or I'm going to sink them. It's going to be one or the other. So let's start with the cruiser here. Okay. Now this time the modifier on the chart for an airstrike is, or I'm sorry, naval damage check table is I'm going to get plus one for an airstrike, but that's it. Okay. So looking to get at least an eight, no, sorry, a seven or better because it's a light cruiser. Its defense value is eight. And hold on. I just had a mutiny. One of my dice didn't cooperate. Okay. It's a seven. Plus one for the airstrike is an eight. So that ship is sunk. Okay. Now, if it is a ship that is a ship like this, it's a, whoops, sorry, I'm kind of covering things there. It's hard to hold these because, you know, there we go. That's a good shot. Uh, my big old hand there, right? Um, if it's a ship like a light cruiser, destroyer cruiser, it basically gets recycled into the reinforcement cup and it can come out later whenever you have reinforcements. Because in this game, some units are named, most of them are not, especially the cruisers, the destroyers, the heavy cruisers, they're not named at all. Okay. Now, if this was a capital ship, a battleship, or an aircraft carrier, it's out of the game permanently, okay? Game over, all right? Now, we also have the heavy cruiser, which took two hits here. So we'll roll the dice twice. And let's see what we get. Now, the heavy cruiser requires a nine or more to sink it. So I rolled a five and a seven. Ooh, that seven was close, but seven plus one is eight, so I only damaged it, but it is damaged, so now it will go, and remember, we double the hit value here, so actually, this is going to be four reinforcement turns later, this cruiser will be able to return to action, so we count off one, two, three, four, so they won't be back basically till the end of the year, so that was successful, so I did take a bit of a gamble as the Japanese, but it actually worked out just fine, okay, now we go on to the surface combat step. Now, the surface combat step 
the first thing you're going to do is figure out where you want to put your ships. Okay, you can either leave them in the bombardment boxes and then you'll be able to use their firepower rating as ground support, rolling dice, trying to get those hits, or you can put them in the sea control box to challenge the opponent for sea control. Well, there is no opponent here because the airstrikes from which carriers was he? I'm just curious to see which carriers I sent here. Oh, the Shikaku and the Zubikaku. Uh, those two are the carriers that came down. There's nobody here. So I'm going to put the destroyer here because remember, if you don't have sea control, you won't be able to land. Okay. So we won't have any surface combat here. Again, we'll probably have that later on here. I know we'll definitely have it in the um, Dutch East Indies. And now, since there's no surface combat, I have control of the sea. We'll move on to the land combat step, which now I can go ahead and land my amphibious force and move it to the base box here. Okay? So, there is nobody there. There's, there was nobody there again. It must have been like a garrison or something like that. Okay? So now, basically, we don't have to do any die rolling for that. But again, we'll see some land combat a little bit later in this video as we move along. Okay? Now... Everybody that survived the battle goes back on the map. There's an administrative step to every single battle. And if there is a land unit, unit that is in an enemy controlled base without an enemy land unit, we place an occupied base marker on it. So I'm going to take all these Japanese forces, except the air units because they're long range air, and I'm going to place an occupied base marker on the Gilbert Islands. And the Gilberts will now come under my control well, my course company, the Japanese, this turn. And this air unit will go back to the marshals, the long-range air, and that's that particular fight. And, of course, I will also get, later on, a victory point when we count up towards the end of the turn. Okay? So that's that particular battle there that we're doing. Now, I'm going to go ahead and go move on to another battle. Again, show you some other um, situations here. So we're going to have this huge, and I do mean huge, massive tussle at Rabol. This is going to be a big fight, much bigger than the last one was. So, again, the first thing we do is the submarine step. Okay? And subs can target any ship that's involved. Okay? Now, there is an American carrier, so obviously I'm going to go for that. But this time, the United States has destroyers. So the U.S. destroyers will get a chance to attempt to defeat the subpoint in this particular battle. Okay, And again, when you first start learning this game, you know, again, religiously, go to the charts and tables. Check everything carefully. Again, it took me a while to wrap my head around this. It took me quite a few days to get through my very first play. But again, once you get your head wrapped around how this works and flows, it just... I don't know how else to put it except to say it feels good. It feels like the Pacific Theater to me, like from everything I've ever read. Again, uh, you know, like Gary Kasparov once said with chess, you know, chess is more than pure calculation. You have to feel the position. And to me, this game feels like the Pacific Theater of World War II. So let's check the ASW here after my little digression. Okay. And let's see. Doo -doo -doo. Where is it here on the chart? Here we go. And we do get a modifier if there's a friendly land-based air unit or carrier in the hex. Well, there is. So these two destroyers will get to roll two dice. Yikes. And they will hit again on a four, five, or six with a plus one. So my sub is in for some trouble. And they're not very lucky because it was a couple of five. So, my subs got sunk, that's that, all right? Now we move on to the next phase of the combat turn, which, after we do the sub phase, now we move on to the battle board preparation phase, okay? So, let's start with the Allies. Well, we'll put this New Zealand unit in here because they're physically there on the base, okay? And then we have these destroyers that are with the aircraft carrier, they're up there because basically the U.S. reaction here is not so much to try and hold on to Rabul because that's probably not going to happen. But what they're hoping to do is sink a Japanese carrier because that, of course, would be a huge assistance to the situation. And that would make a big, big difference Okay, when it comes down to it. All right. So 
I brought down with the Japanese, I brought down one aircraft carrier with two destroyers, and I also bought a CVL with one destroyer, and then I also have this cruiser with this division that I'm going to attack um, if I get, of course, control of the sea, I'm going to attack Revol with. All right, so here we go, step by step through the battle. So everybody's on the battle board. So now we'll have air to air combat. So we total up the air points that are available to both sides. So the Japanese carriers have a total of six points. The U.S. carrier has a total of four. Okay. Now both sides will roll their dice, looking for hits again you know, fives and sixes. And once that's done, whatever air points are left, then they'll be able to do an airstrike. So let's go ahead. The Japanese are the aggressors. So two, four. Let's do them first. Six. So roll six dice. Looking for fives and sixes, because I will double check here. I don't believe there's any modifiers here with this air-to-air -air one here. No, most of them are italicized except the first turn. The Japanese do get that um, modifier. So two, four, six. Looking for fives and sixes. The Japanese got two hits. They got a five and a six. So that is going to reduce the U.S. air power by two points. The U.S. has four air points. Let's see what they get. And the U.S. scored a single hit. So the U.S. will reduce two air points, one, two. And the Japanese will be reduced one air point down. Okay? So now these air points, of course, now will be committed in the attack phase here against whatever task force you want to go ahead and put them on um, to try and defeat and destroy the enemy. All right, so air superiority. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot air superiority here because now we have to talk about air superiority because we actually resolved it here between the two sides, okay? So whoever has more air points gets air superiority. So that is the Japanese. They have five points to two. So that will give them a plus one modifier. That is critical whenever you're talking about some of these attacks and such. Okay? So now we're on to the airstrike phase itself. Okay. So the target determination, okay, the player without the air superiority determines his targets first. And that's one thing that makes this game solo friendly is that it, it kind of plays the same way two-player as, as solo because since you have this thing where, hey, whoever doesn't have the air superiority has to commit the air, air units first, well, then you have to and just do it to the best of your ability. I mean, granted, your you know, your opponent might have a brain freeze and, and commit, you know, air points where you're like, you know, you turn into Scooby-Doo and you're like, Raggy? It doesn't make any sense. But, um, you know, generally speaking, it doesn't make this game solo friendly. I haven't had any trouble playing this game solo at all, okay? So, the U.S. will go ahead and put its two air points against the big aircraft carrier. I mean, hey, you know, go big or go home, right? You might as well. Now, the Japanese have five air points, and they will put it against the task force with the U.S. one, too. Because remember, you can't go after the land unit because you cannot do an airstrike against the land unit. It doesn't do you any good, okay? So, we've determined our targets. We've declared our situation here. So, now that we have target target determination, now we have the airstrike um, round. So we start with anti-aircraft fire. So let's go ahead and we'll start with the Japanese. And again, it's the second number. So their anti-aircraft fire is going to be a two altogether. They've got two dice to roll against those two U.S. air points that are coming in. They rolled a three and a two, so they completely blew it. They totally missed. Okay? No good. The U.S. will have... We'll total them up. Two, three, four, five. So theoretically, the U.S. could shoot down all five of these points. Let's see. Here we go. Wow. The U.S. only shot down one. That's it. Okay. So there is one point that was blasted, leaving four Japanese air points to strike with. Okay. So now we'll go ahead and we'll do the U.S. strike here. And the U.S. is just rolling straight up. Okay. They don't get any modifiers for this airstrike at all against the Japanese carrier. So we're looking for fives and sixes here for the U.S. And it's a three and a one. So the U.S.'s gamble here to send this carrier task force out has failed. Okay. Now the Japanese have four, and we'll move the U.S. down to zero because now they've finished using up all their air points. Now the Japanese have four, and remember, they have air superiority. 
Okay, so when they launch this airstrike, they have air supremacy, they have air superiority, they will go ahead and be able to add plus one to the die roll. So, here we go. Let's see. There's a four dice. Ooh, the four dice. I've got, well, I have one that mutinied, so hold on a second. Let me re-roll the one that mutinied. These guys are just not. Ooh, whew. So the Japanese rolled a two, which is no good. But they rolled a five and two fours. And those fours with the plus one, they turn into fives. So that put three hits on the U.S. aircraft carrier. Okay. Now, when we look at the damage table, again, it is a plus one modifier because it is an airstrike hit. So we got to roll for each hit. So here we go. The U.S. carrier is a value of 10. So hold on to your butts here if you're uh, if you're cheering for the USN. Here we go. The first roll is a three. No sweat. Second roll. Woo, that's a little higher. It's a six, but good. Last one is a four. Five. So the U.S. aircraft carrier will be damaged, but not destroyed. So it will not be sent to the bottom of the ocean. However, once again, three hits. So we double those for damage. That is six. So six reinforcement phases in the future is what we're looking at here. Whew, it's going to take a long time to fix these carriers here. And which two carriers were these? Just out of curiosity. Yorktown and Lexington. Okay. So we count off. One, two, three, four, five, and Six. So those carriers are going to take a long time to get back into the battle because the Japanese got very, very lucky with their airstrike there. And again, Japan's air points are now down to zero. All right. All right. So now we'll move on to the surface combat phase where the Japanese will put their heavy cruiser that was escorting in. They will go ahead and head into the sea control box. Okay. The U.S. does not have any units there, so there's nothing there for them to do. All right, so now the Japanese land unit will show up, and now we'll have our land combat phase, our first one for this video, okay? So basically, land, land combat, first thing you gotta do is figure out supply. Supply is based on who has control of the sea. So if the Japanese, like they have here control, they would get their units in supply. If the U.S. had managed to end up with control of the sea, then it would cut the supply source to the opponent. If neither player has control of the sea, okay, then you check supply lines, which is explained earlier in the rules, to see are your units in supply. Well, in this particular case, the Japanese have control because of the cruiser, so we'll go ahead and do a land combat. And land combat, again, you're rolling a number of dice equal to the combat factor. And because the New Zealand unit is out of supplies, they will suffer a minus one modifier. Again, this isn't like most war games where, you know, when you think a unit's out of supply, it's like, oh, I have to half their combat factors and stuff. No, it's actually a subtraction problem here. So the Japanese have four dice, looking for fives and sixes. So let's see what happens here. They got two hits, okay? They rolled two fives. The New Zealanders roll two dice, but they have a minus one modifier. Ooh. They roll a six and a five. So the five, unfortunately, is no good with the minus one modifier, but the six is. So now we look to the land, the combat damage step. Now, damage resolution, by the way, in the rulebook is separate from all of this. It's rule 13, so be prepared to flip back and forth um, between those. Uh, it's, yeah, it's basically, you know, there. But there is a you know, return schedule and all that kind of stuff um, for units on the chart itself. Um, so just keep that in mind um, when you're looking at, at the rules. Because again, it, it, it's the rule book is, it has it separated out. So that can be a little um, aggravating at first, I guess is the best way to put it. Alright, so with land damage, here's basically how the land combat works, okay? Now, if the defender, the non-phasing player, has equal or greater than this, the hits that there are, nothing happened, okay? That's just that. If the phasing player, aka the attacker, has a total that's greater than the non-phasing player, then he's going to flip the unit. So this unit would get flipped to its other side 
to one step. Now, if the attacker had actually, sorry, oof, had actually rolled um, a greater amount than the defender and the number of combat strength factors, so in other words, I would have had to have rolled greater than um, two here, it would have been completely eliminated. Yeah, it has to be greater, not equal. So unfortunately I had two, so I, this is not quite over yet. So the allies could try to find a way to maybe get supply there to this base, okay? So with the land combat over, we go to the administrative, administrative phase at this point in time here, and we bring everybody back onto the map here at Rabul. So the Japanese are in the driver's seat, clearly. But it's not over. And basically the Allies are going to force them to take some more time to wear that down. So that's unfortunate. I was hoping that with those four dice they'd be able to get a better hit in, but it was not working for that. Okay? Alright, let's do one more combat example here. And I'll do the one from the Dutch East Indies. Uh, just to give you an idea of how that works. And then I think we'll go ahead and close this video with some comments because I think that'll be enough to give you an idea of combat here. Okay? Now, again, we get our forces here put together. Okay? And we prepare for battle in this particular situation. Okay? Um, and again, I... I what I did here was not necessarily the optimal strategy or the optimal move on the board. I just kind of did it to give you an idea of how things work, to give you examples of what's going on here. Okay, So basically here in this battle, we've got a couple of Japanese ships, and we've got the two Dutch ships that sortied from their uh, harbor, from their port, to challenge Okay, for battle. Now, there's no sub points for either side, so we could just skip that sub phase there. There's no air points either. Nobody did that. I thought about bringing a Japanese aircraft carrier. I almost took that CVL instead of taking it for, um, uh, I think it was Rabo I put that CVL and I almost took it over here, but I thought, mm, we should be able to pull this off even in a surface engagement, you know, so to speak. So, let's go ahead. But again, it's always good just to go through each step, especially when you're first learning a game, to make sure that you're not forgetting anything. Okay. So there's no submarine thing here. We'll do the battle board preparation. So the Dutch units are at their base. And we'll have these two surface units as a task force. And of course we have this task force here with the Japanese invasion force in tow. Okay. Now, there's no air combat to worry about because we don't have any air units here. So now we go deal with the surface combat phase. So both sides are going to fight for control of the sea because that's the critical thing here. If the Dutch can somehow manage to inflict damage enough on the Japanese to defeat them and not get sea control, the Japanese will have to then um, abandon their amphibious assault. So that is what the Dutch are hoping for here. Okay, And the Japanese, of course, don't want to risk the idea and they don't think they're going to need the bombardment, but maybe they will, who knows, um, to support the other battle there. Um, to win this land battle, okay? So, once everything's set up here, now both players would secretly set their units into battle groups here, but of course, I don't have that because this is a solo game, so I just kind of match everybody up. Um, basically, I usually do it by air superiority, and then of course, um, if not by air superiority, then kind of do it with um, the defender having the advantage here because of course, the enemy is coming to them. So depending on what they're spotting, what they're seeing, Etc. Just trying to get this tight enough. Uh, there we go. That should be good enough there. Okay. So you basically line your ships up and you start shooting. Now notice, the ground unit the Japanese had is not eligible for anything here. You can't target it. The only way you can target it is with air power. So if the Dutch had had an air unit here, they would have been able to launch an airstrike against it. That is the only way to attack it. You cannot attack a land or air unit that's being transported by sea in a surface round of combat. So. Let's go ahead and let's start firing our big guns, okay? Now, we'll do this first matchup over here. So the firing ability of the Dutch destroyer is a zero. Now that might sound like it'll be like, oh man, shoot, they can't fire. Well, technically they can't, because here's how the fire combat chart works. Um, let me see, where did I, here we go. You know what, let's pull back a little bit. 
There we go. I'll pull back a little bit so that way you can see it a little bit better. Let me tilt this up a little bit too. Here we go. There. Let me see if I can get a better shot there. Okay. So now basically what you do is you look at the firepower rating and cross-reference it with the defensive rating of the ship you're shooting at. Now, this Japanese cruiser has a defense rating of 9. So basically the Dutch need to roll a 6 to score a hit. Notice some of these have asterisks. If they have an asterisk, it only counts as half a hit. And usually that's when destroyers are trying to take on even bigger ships than cruisers. Otherwise, um, you know, they at least have a shot, so to speak. No pun intended, I guess, um, when it comes down to that. Okay, So we'll be rolling for that there. It'll be a 0 against the 9. And then the Japanese cruiser will be rolling a 1 against the 8. So notice that gives them a much greater chance. They need a 4, 5, or 6 to land a hit. So let's see what happens here in this battle. So we'll fire off the Dutch shot first. They need a 6. And they rolled a 2. Okay? And it is only a single die roll, by the way, too. Um, it's not, you don't roll dice per number of factors, because like battleships have two um, attack factors to them. It's one die that you roll, and then you cross reference basically on the table. That's it. You're only rolling one. Or, as the chart says, one die per attacking ship. Okay? So four ones with the Japanese need. Ooh, they rolled a one, so they missed. Interesting. Okay, now this light cruiser from the Dutch Navy has a 1 going up against a 9. So we look at the chart, 1 cross reference with 9, they need a 5 or a 6 to score a hit. Ooh, they just missed, they rolled a 4. So now the Japanese cruiser again, a 1 against an 8, they need a 4, 5, or 6. Oh, they rolled a 2. So they missed. Now, at this point in the surface combat round, what would happen next is if you had any ships that were damaged, those ships you would roll for, okay, and see what happened. Did it get sunk? Did it get damaged? If it gets damaged, it is removed from the battle and put on the turn record chart. And then, if there's still ships there, then you can go ahead and shoot again, okay? Now, both sides have the option to withdraw if they want from the battle. I'm not going to do that here because I just want to show how everything works and finish off this combat example. So, we're not going to go ahead and worry about that. We're just going to go ahead and keep pounding on each other until there's no one left. So let's go back here again. We've got this matchup. So we got the destroyer needing a six. We got a four. We got the Japanese needing a four. Or better. Hey, this time they got a four. So bam. And I like to use dice to mark things like that. Um, just because uh, I enjoy. Oops, I forgot to zoom back in. My apologies. Ah, some days are better than others. That's all there is to it. But at least you can see a little bit, right? There you go. There's a better shot for everybody now. Okay. And I like to use quite a few dice. I use about, quite frankly, between 15 and 20 dice per side. Because, um, of course, I've accumulated God knows how many dice over the years. So I just use the dice to mark the hits rather than use the hit marker. It's just my own thing. I mean, you know, you can do your own thing if you like. Whatever works. I mean, you know, that's the way I look at it. So, Dutch Cruiser. Firing on... Light cruiser, firing on the Japanese heavy cruiser. Need a five or a six. Oh, and they did get a six. Bam! They hit him. So the Japanese are returning fire. They need four better. And they got a five. Okay. So let's go ahead and resolve the damage here. We'll start with the Dutch ship. So, now, when it comes to damage on a surface engagement, okay, you add the the firepower rating of the attacker. So for example here, this cruiser here will add one to the die roll. And again, now if it ends up being a seven or better, that cruiser is done for. It is a six plus one is seven. So it will be damaged, which will remove it from the fight. The other one, the Dutch destroyer, will have again a plus one. It rolled a seven. Plus one is eight, so that is sunk. And I throw it into my sunk cup over there. And this one will be removed. And the Dutch units, if they're damaged in the game because, you know, the resources the Dutch had, because, of course, this is after, you know, Nazi Germany had conquered them and stuff, um, you know, they're basically removed from the game anyway. But let's check the fate of this Japanese cruiser. This will be the interesting part here, okay? So with a light cruiser that fired at them, it's going to be a plus one. It's a six. So the good news for the Japanese and for the IJN is no worries there. But they will be 
of course, knocked out. One hit times two, the next two friendly reinforcement phases. So they won't be back until the middle of summer 1942. Okay. So now with the surface combat over, we move the surviving ships back. The Japanese do have sea control, so they will land there and attempt to attack and defeat the Dutch force. And again, the Dutch, since they're out of supply, will suffer a minus one modifier to their attacking um, role. So here we go. Japanese force rolling four dice, and they got two hits on the defending Dutch force. The Dutch force gets to roll four dice, but again, minus one for the die roll. Being out of supply, they manage to roll six, which gives them one hit. So once again, the attacker has more... Well, here, I'm going to put my dice down. The attacker has more hits than the defender. So, it's not greater than the defending unit's combat factor, which is a four. So, it will just flip them. So, again, maybe the Japanese... Oh, well, you know what? Actually, this Dutch unit does not have a backside. I keep forgetting that. Um, so, bye-bye. And that means that the Japanese have been successful here, and they got the oil they covet so much. So, again, we'll move units here to the map. And I will go ahead and place a control marker here for Japan. Okay. Um, I know I said that was going to be the last battle, but I'll tell you what. What I'll do is I'll finish out one of these battles here, the land battles here. At, um, I'll tell you what, I'll do Manila because Manila is such a, a, a pain. It is my Achilles not Achilles heel, it's my, it's my, I believe the French expression is bait in the wall. Um, like Bobby Fischer's bait in the wall was, um, um, uh, oh, Yefim Geller, that's the guy's name. Yeah, okay. So let me reorganize this here, because I know we've been kind of bouncing around. So let me come back out a little bit, get the battle board better, there we go. So, sorry, well, I know when I'm getting rolling and explaining some of this stuff, I've kind of forgot to zoom in and out and stuff, so my apologies. Uh, to all of you for that, but hopefully you've been able to follow along as I've been doing things um, here, okay? So again, we're going to go ahead and there's no naval ships here in this particular fight. This is all about land and air units that are going on here. So I'll put the land units in their base. I'll put these long-range air units in their spot here, okay? And we'll go ahead and and start the whole process again so there's no sub points to worry about. The air points that are here, again, it's half because they're long range. So there's eight, which will give me four. Now, again, I cannot directly airstrike this unit, but I can do ground support to add extra hits whenever the actual land battle itself is occurring. Okay? So now, supply, of course, because nobody has technically sea control. There's no ships in either one, so they'll have to trace supply. And of course, the United States is going to be hard pressed to do supply because there really is nowhere for them to go with their supply. Um, given the way the Japanese have deployed their forces, uh, there's no way to get supply through. So the U.S. will be out of supply because of um, their supply lines. So that'll be that from that perspective. So. Let's go ahead and finish this off here. So we've got the four air points. They'll be used as ground support. So we'll roll those dice first. And we got two hits, which is good. Because remember, since the U.S. has a four defense factor, if we can get four or five hits or more out of this, we'll be able to win. Now, the Japanese attack factor is eight. So two, four, six, eight. And now they need three more hits out of those eight to basically end this thing completely. Or at least have more than the U.S. because the U.S. unit is already flipped. And the Japanese land unit scored four hits. So that's going to give a total now of six altogether. And we'll roll for the U.S. just because, you know, it's a proper thing to do. And it's good when you're learning a game because it's good for the practice. Okay, But the U.S rolled a couple of fives, and remember with that supply issue, minus one, those are fours. So the U.S. unit is defeated, and now Manila will fall. And from the Japanese perspective, I can tell you, the next thing I want to say is Hala Bloody Luga. Because 
Manila really has been a pain in my, to use a, a good word that my mother used to use when I was growing up, uh, a Slovak word, dupa. It's a pain in my dupa. And yes, dupa is what you think it is. Okay, now the land unit that was defeated here, just to kind of finish things off here and such, um, eliminated land units are placed on the turn record track two friendly reinforcement phases later, except of course the Dutch one there. So again, this American land unit will come back. Two friendly phases will actually be the April, June of 42. Okay. So, and that's that. So that's the combat phase. Okay. So I know this video ran a little bit longer, but I did want to give you all the opportunity to, you know, um, see how all this works and tried to show you a variety of battles. So some final thoughts here on the game. Um, I do like this. I really, really like this. I cannot believe, quite frankly, that I sold it originally. I don't know why. I did look up in my records on Board Game Geek because I did sell it through the Geek and I sold it in December of the same year that I got it because I pre-ordered this thing. I think it's the only game I ever pre-ordered from Multiman Publishing Company. Think of it. And I'm not sure why I did it. I'm not sure, because, you know, it's 13 years ago. That's a lot of water under the bridge. I'm not sure if it's because I couldn't wrap my head around it. And, you know, if you look at the threads on Board Game Geek, it took a while to kind of get things out there and such. Or I just, my Pacific Theater interest was waning, which has resurged here over the last couple of years. Um, I've always been fascinated. World War II, the two things that fascinate me the most are tanks and aircraft carriers. So I've always enjoyed the aircraft carrier battles early on in the war. In the Pacific, and then of course the Eastern Front of World War II, because you know the encirclements and the Panzer thrusts, and you know the 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 um, the deep attack Soviet concept in the second half of the war has always intrigued me. So for me, this game is staying in my collection now for good. To me, if I want to play the strategic war in the Pacific theater and do it rapidly with a really neat way of doing it, this is the game I'm going to go to now. That being said, Across the Pacific will stay in my collection too, simply because it has one edge that this game does not, and that edge is the chit pulls. Because the strategic and then the operational chits let you again recreate a Lady Golf. Now, can I recreate Lady Golf with this? I'm not sure yet. I have to do a little more work on this, play with it, research if you will. But right now, my instinct, my gut is telling me no. And that's why Across the Pacific will stay in my collection if I really want to, you know, go elaborate with that. Um, but Across the Pacific, you have to be careful because you lose your aircraft carriers early in the war. The way that the whole system works, you're basically, you stick a fork in you, you're pretty much done. Okay, which again, is kind of what the Japanese were hoping. They were hoping to, to hit the U.S. bad enough and then bleed them down, which is ironic because basically... You know, 25, 20, 25 years later, that's what North Vietnam was basically trying to do to the U.S., and it was successful in that particular case. Um, it's basically that kind of strategy, that kind of plan. Okay, So it is interesting to me and fascinating, um, you know, studying this war, particularly from the point of, you know, how Japan was planning on trying to win this thing. Um, and there is a book, I believe it's put out by... Um, the MIT security studies press and stuff uh, about asymmetrical warfare, wars launched by weaker powers against stronger ones, and there's a whole chapter on that. So if you're interested in that topic, check it out. I, I don't see it on my shelf handy. Otherwise, I would pull it off and show it to you, but I don't. Let me just check real quick. I want to say it's got a green edge to it, but let me just look and see. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing it here on the shelf any place. Uh, but it's an interesting book. It is fascinating. Let me just shuffle a little bit more here because I think if it's here it's going to be on this shelf somewhere. But I'm not seeing it. Yeah, okay, it's not there. Alright, so anyway, that is what it's called. I'm pretty sure it's called Asymmetrical Warfare. It's got a green cover to it. So, bottom line is this. If you want to play a Pacific Theater game and you can track this game down, I don't make this sound like the A-Team, you know, if you're looking for this game and no one else can help you and you can find them, you know, this is this is a game that's sought after and it is expensive on the secondary market. Um, I ended up paying 90 bucks to get my hands on this. It's in very good shape, by the way, too. Um, 
but it, it was punched, so I'll just throw that out there. However, again, if you want a playable Pacific Theater game, something more complex than like Pacific War, Philippines, uh, Pearl Harbor to the Philippines, rather, or like Greater East Asia, Coast Prosperity Sphere, or like Victory in the Pacific, if you played that, this is the game I would go with. Um, this game has the feel, it has the flow. I I'm really impressed with this game. And again, I just shake my head thinking, why in the world did I sell it to begin with? So, hopefully this helped with wrapping heads around. Again, if I made any mistakes, by all means, please mention it in the comments so we can discuss it. You know, again, because if I made a mistake, it'll help me play the game better and help other people play the game better too in the long run. Now, real quickly here before I go, um, I will just say this. I think what I'm going to do next is, some of you may have heard about this, some of you may not have, because um, these games are kind of in a weird place, but uh, DVG games, Dan Versing games, just produced a set of four games, actually, concerning the War of the Worlds, the classic H.G. Wells novel, and um, let me see here if I can grab it off the shelf real quick. I'll show you what it looks like. There's four different games, one of them with the original England fight, one of them with the East Coast uh, as well, and that's the one I'm going to start with because it depicts my home state of Virginia. You can see up there, ES, USA East Coast. I'll just show you the back real quick, too. So, I, I have always loved this book ever since I was a kid. It was the first classic book I ever really read. So, I'm going to go ahead and tinker with this next. And I think I'll make a video, maybe for each one, because from my understanding, what I've seen on the website is each one of the games, there are there's unique human characteristics and advantages depending on which society is. And the four games are the U.S., um, England, Japan, and France. So that's where I think I'll be heading next. So I hope you'll join me. And I hope that, again, my videos here with Fire in the Sky have been a help um, to folks. And, and, again, it's been a help to me. And, again, I just want to say thanks to Wendell um, from Board Game Geek for really helping me out with all the questions that I had. So this is Tim Korchnoy from Bare Bones Wargaming saying thank you for watching and I will see you next time when the Martians land um, and if you can find the 1938 War of the Worlds recording that Orson Welles did totally cool stuff um, that will put you in the mood for that if you've never actually listened to it the actual radio broadcast itself by all means do the first half because it sounds like news reports and stuff totally Cool. And that was another thing, too. When I was a kid, I had a friend who, um, and this is back in the day, you know, before the internet and stuff, had a cassette tape, two cassette tape, um, um, well, two cassette tapes that he got from some classic radio catalog or something like that. And I listened to that, and I was just like, dude, this is so cool. It's like, it was like the novel come to life. So, um, so I'm looking forward to trying those games. And again, I hope you'll join me uh, as I try to defeat the Martians and protect all of mankind uh, in the process. So until next time, Tim Korchnoy saying thanks for watching uh, here. And again, um, I hope you all enjoy the immersive videos that I'm doing here. So catch you next time.